So are there any questions uh, from, from any of uh, the brethren? Bart Shaw. Thanks, David. I thought that was an awesome presentation. Um, I'm a little biased. I grew up listening to my father teach uh, this, Orville Lee Smith, as well as others. Um, do you make, John 17, Judas Iscariot is called the man of perdition, son of perdition. John 17, verse 12, I think it is. And of course, the man of sin then is connected to the son of perdition. Do, do you see any connection between Judas, one of the apostles, for the love of money falling away, and, and then obviously the apostasy uh, of the Roman Catholic Church? Well, I see similar similarity of language. I, I'm not, not sure if there's a connection there or not. Uh, perhaps someone has made one that I'm not aware of, but uh, um, I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but I know there are past phrases in the New Testament that are similar, that are unrelated, and that's my impression of, of that. Do you know of something? I just think it's an interesting connection oh, that we yeah. have an, oh, an apostle, close. obviously very close to the Lord Jesus, uh, who, uh, because of his love of money, fell away from the truth and betrayed the Lord. And then <clears throat> the church at Rome, uh, certainly the center of, of the world at that time at the capital and beloved by Paul, and, uh, and then had one of the greatest theological letters written to them. And then they, they fall away from the truth. And, and as you pointed out, perdition means destruction, which is certainly coming uh, for apostates against, against the Lord. So it just seems to me to be an interesting, obviously there's no direct line drawn in scripture, but right. I think per, that word perdition, and you, you would know far better than I, it's not used very often. And uh, so it does seem you know, used sparsely, and it, to me it seems like there might yeah, be a connection. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. I, I would have to look at that. It's a very good study. I yeah, appreciate it. I'll go ahead and bring up the First John passage and ask what you think about this in First John chapter 2 and verse 18. It says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Now, I'm reading from the New King James Version. The New King James seems to have an individual and a group mentioned there. It says, the Antichrist is coming. Of course, it's capitalized in our English translations, not necessarily in the Greek, but it's capitalized as if it's an individual. The Antichrist is coming. And then he says, even now, there are many Antichrists that are here, lowercase a there. You see any significance there with one appearing to be a certain individual and the other seem to be a group of individuals? Well, he does seem to be saying, he does seem to be indicating that there is some future individual, future from their time, uh, that has this title. Or the, the Antichrist. I, I want to comment that the, that the capitalization, of course, is an interpretation of the translators. Uh, there is no, as you know, no capitalization in Greek. But, uh, but uh, it does look like that he is describing some individual that he has in mind. Uh, however, the characteristics he has are those, he says, there are many of them. And in John, uh, the Antichrist is one who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I welcome any view anyone has on, or interpretation anyone may have on that passage. Did I ask another? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the context for this obviously is Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. This seems to be the problem that the church was experiencing this time with Gnosticism, with some views of Gnosticism saying, you know, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh and all. So is it possible that the Antichrist 
is different than the man of sin at the Antichrist is dealing more with a problem of the first, second, and maybe third century? I think so. I, I, I've entertained that as a possibility uh, in, prior to this study, but especially since this study, that, that the Second Thessalonians passage uh, may stand alone. It may not have any direct reference to other things that are typically associated with it. I mean, especially the futurists, as you know, they just rope all this together and tie it up with Daniel and, and all kinds of things. And, you know, correct me, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't see why there can't be, why these have to be, have to be the same individual in every case. I thought that was excellent, David. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I want to ask a question that's similar to the second question Doug asked, and that is, is it absolutely essential that Romans, uh, excuse me, Revelation 13, uh, verse 18, and the verses just before that, is talking about the same thing that 1 Thessalonians 2 is talking about? Or might they be talking about two different things? Or Revelation 13 maybe is inclusive of this, but maybe broader than this? Well, my, the first thought that comes to my mind is Revelation is not my passage tonight. So, uh, But uh, yes, I think, I think so. Uh, you know, you and I had a little conversation about this a while back that, uh, that the traditional interpretation of the book of Revelation is what I think is called the his continuous historical view that sees it as uh, telling the whole story of history in symbolic language, the whole history since the time of Christ to the end of the world in symbolic language. And usually the papacy is read into those symbols and uh, I know that there is the position that the book of Revelation was probably had a more uh, direct fulfillment in those early centuries or in the early time of Christianity and not necessarily all through history. And so the question is, can 2 Thessalonians stand alone as a prophecy about the papacy and all attendant apostasy, which I think includes in denominationalism and even apostasy in the church, uh, uh, that the passage can stand alone. And the more I've thought about it, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to think that yes, it can. And that Revelation may be a, a completely different, you know, we just do a completely different take on the book of Revelation. Is that answering your question? Very good, sir. In your research, did you run across anywhere where Catholicism or certain tenets of Catholicism believe that the man of sin is the office of the Pope, only it's not a succession, it is a coming Pope? No, I did not. That's my answer. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. It does have its flaws, of course, according to what you presented, but that is a view. Any other questions? If not, uh, David, do you have any questions? Oh, nothing, I guess, that I already, haven't already said. I, I appreciate, again, to, to be here and to be a part of this. Uh, it is a difficult topic. And again, I want to repeat, I'm not dogmatic about this, but this is just kind of where my conclusions have led me. And uh, I entertain any input that any brother wants to bring to me, and I'd be interested to hear about that apostate pope that the Catholic Church is expecting. And uh, so, but I appreciate the, the opportunity. <laughs>